Today, banking on profitability if you're big enough. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Well, this post covering finance and property news. Well, against the backcloth of higher rates for longer, many of the Australian banks will be providing trading updates over the next couple of weeks. As a group, they currently have the highest set of valuation seen for decades, but then their earnings have also held up relative to expectations. So what is ahead and are all banks equal? Well, some analysts are saying that although banks have flat to negative growth coming up this year, from a capital management perspective, they've all got excess capital, so there will be more buybacks and special dividends to come. And so the high valuations are just fine. But then not everyone is convinced. For example, City's Brendan Sprules this past week recommended clients sell out of the big four banks as he downgraded Westpac and ANZ to bring them into line with the sell ratings already held on Commonwealth Bank and National Australia Bank shares. He said CBA shares were simply too expensive at 112.97, up 15.4% in the past six months, with competitive pressure and slowing credit growth likely to subdue NAB's dominant business banking arm. City's downgrades come a month after Macquarie told its clients to underweight everything in the banking sector in Australia. Interestingly, City's call was made at a time when traders had ascribed a 76% chance of the RBA cutting rates this year from the 4.35% level. That's the official cash rate that was held since November 2023. And at the time, cuts were fully priced in for next year too, and so posed a challenge to profits because falling cash rates would bring additional challenges such as headwinds to low rate deposits and political difficulties with repricing loans and the deterioration in asset quality that rate cuts imply. One of the points offered by the bulls is in an easing cycle, it will still provide scope for the banks to reprice mortgages. But Spruill says, we think that politically the banks will find it difficult to reprice. Politically, cost of living pressures are front of mind. Other sectors, such as the supermarkets, are facing immense pressure. And after recovering from the 2018 Royal Commission, the banks will unlikely want to cede some of their recovered goodwill and social license. So as a result, they argued that investors should sell their shares in the country's major banks because opportunistic political attacks on profits will force the lenders to pass on more of the Reserve Bank's expected interest rate cuts at the expense of earnings. But of course, since then, the pivot to higher for longer that we saw this week might change that narrative. Juno Bank's chief economic advisor, Warren Hogan, warned this week of perhaps three additional rate rises this year as Australia's economy faces sticky inflation. So the long tail of the rate cycle will become a feature of the half-year reporting season for NAB, Westpac and ANZ. Higher rates does provide more headroom for margin growth. As mortgage rates are held higher, deposit rates are managed sideways or lower to protect margins. On the other hand, funding costs will continue to rise and bad debts might also lift as more households and businesses fold under the pressure. This time last year, of course, three of the big four banks were compelled to withdraw their mortgage cashback offers from the market because of the intense competition for borrowers. So trying to read this is complex, especially in the extend and pretend environment that we've had as banks continue to support customers in trouble and look to cut costs hard, including, of course, bank branch closures. And while persistent inflation has raised the prospect of more rate rises from the RBA in 2024, which could put pressure on bank bag debts, CBA's head of retail, Angus Sullivan, said the outlook was still positive. In fact, the major banks are preparing to declare maybe $4.5 billion worth of dividends and share buybacks over the next two weeks in what's expected to be a resilient earnings season. Beginning with National Australia Bank on Thursday, Macquarie reports full year earnings on Friday, Westpac will report on May the 6th, ANZ on May the 7th, while CBA will deliver a quarterly update on May the 9th. 
Now, we do certainly expect to see some special dividends or further share buybacks this time around, and demand from Asian investors who are fleeing China's battered markets and seeking shelter on the ASX may also provide some more support for those extended valuations. But it is worth highlighting that not all banks are created equal because regional banks, including Bendigo and Adelaide Bank and the Bank of Queensland, are under the pump and look to be dying a slow death because of higher costs of funds compared to the big four banks, higher capital requirements, the upward pressure on costs from upgrading technology and just the sheer lack of scale. In fact, the return on equity earned by the Bank of Queensland and Bendigo and Adelaide banks is around 5 to 8%, which is well below their cost of capital, which is around 10% at the moment. And regional banks are paying about 30 to 40 basis points more than the big four banks when raising money in wholesale markets. This more expensive wholesale funding for regional banks has allowed the big four to entrench their competitive advantages. The wholesale funding disadvantage for regionals was highlighted by the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission last year. And over the years, regional bank CEOs and second tier bankers such as Joseph Healy at Junobank have complained repeatedly about the higher capital requirements compared to the big four. But their calls for a level playing field have fallen on deaf ears. In fact, weirdly, APRA has argued that it's probably easier for them to regulate fewer banks, but of course it will not necessarily be good for banking customers, particularly those living in regional areas served by the Bank of Queensland and Bendigo and Adelaide banks. And APRA also estimated that the average pricing differential for residential mortgages between internal ratings based and standardised banks, in other words the big guys versus the small guys, would be at around five basis points. But this conflicts with the commercial reality experienced by the regional banks. Actually, Analysis shows that for around $100 of mortgage lending, a regional bank would have to hold $1.60 of capital, whereas the big four banks will only need to hold $0.60 cents of capital. So there is a big unlevel playing field. Plus, there's plenty of evidence about the lack of a level playing field. It was also put forward last year during the regulatory reviews of the Suncorp Bank sale by the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission and the Australian Competition Tribunal. The ACCC investigation of the ANZ's takeover of Suncorp exposed the high costs of technological upgrades. Another issue for regional banks that harms their competitiveness is the lack of scale. Bank of Queensland and Bendigo and Adelaide have about 2.5% to 3% market shares, sitting just below Macquarie's 5%. So Treasury, the RBA and APRA do need to ask themselves whether they're happy to ultimately have a financial services sector dominated by just four banks and Macquarie. And this is why a public bank providing essential banking services to communities should be part of the solution, something which we hope will be tabled in the final report from the Senate that's currently looking at regional branch closures. As major banks leave smaller population centres without service, we do need a valid alternative. And in fact, we'll be discussing this again on Tuesday's live show at 8pm Sydney time with Robbie Barwick. But meantime, the larger players continue to buttress their profits at the expense of ordinary Australians. And while the market likes higher valuation, Australia Inc. is actually all the poorer. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching and I'll see you again next time.